As stated previously, the Cuban Missile Crisis really can be seen as a major, major turning point in the Cold War. Uh, one scholar uh, remarking on the occasion uh, describes two superpowers walking up to the brink, uh, looking down, and finally edging away. Um, however, the United States found itself increasingly admired in another war, in a very different type of war, uh, in Vietnam. Uh, as I had mentioned previously, the Kennedy administration expanded military assistance uh, to South Vietnam, as well as uh, 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 a, a huge flow, really a torrent of money and technical assistance in hopes of creating a viable state there. Uh, however, the failure of No Dien Diem or any other South, Vietne South Vietnamese leader to really create a, a stable government there um, uh, led, uh, uh, led the situation there to become increasingly perilous. Um, Kennedy's assassination, meanwhile, uh, brought to power in the United States his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, who perhaps had somewhat less of a grasp of foreign policy, being primarily uh, a, a master of the domestic political scene. In 1964, an incident, incident uh, in the Gulf of Tonkin uh, led, uh, became sort of the causus belli for a U.S. resolution and eventually the introduction of hundreds of thousands of American troops into the country. This was known as the Americanization of the Vietnam War. And at its zenith, uh, 500, uh, 560,000 American troops would fight in that country. Alongside these troops, uh, the United States conducted numerous bombing raids against uh, the North Vietnamese countryside, known as Rolling Thunder, as well as various other designations, but found itself struggling and indeed failing to win over the hearts and minds of those peasants in the countryside. Um, a, a, a military focus on a body count as opposed to creating viable political uh, settlements led eventually to, in 1968, uh, an event that would very much weaken the American cause. This was the Tet Offensive. Uh, the Tet Offensive uh, took place in December of 1968 when uh, Viet Cong forces in, the South, in South Vietnam lay siege uh, to Saigon. And although uh, US, uh, US forces as well as their South Vietnamese allies uh, uh, rebuffed and eventually defeated uh, this uh, this attack, they won the proverbial battle but ended up losing the war. This had a deep psychological effect on uh, the American population, uh, perhaps uh, embodied most famously in the character of Walter Cronkite, perhaps the nation's most famous uh, uh, primetime broadcaster, who declared, in essence, the war lost. Uh, Johnson, watching the newscast at the time, remarked that if he had lost Walter Cronkite, he had lost the war. Now, Vietnam very much was the rock upon which the Johnson administration uh, uh, sunk itself. And it's easy in hindsight to lose sight of a couple of achievements during that time that actually uh, saw the beginning of a new relationship uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union. And this is perhaps most apparent in the realm of nuclear arms control and nonproliferation. So if Vietnam destroyed the Johnson presidency, uh, he did get the ball rolling on uh, some arms control agreements with the Soviet Union as well as the wider world. Uh, the first of these had come uh, before he rose to power uh, when President Kennedy was uh, occupying the Oval Office, and this was the 1963 Limited Test Ban Treaty. Uh, this was uh, uh, a treaty that prohibited the testing of nuclear weapons uh, underwater in the atmosphere uh, are in outer space. It left out uh, underground testing, which would uh, become the channel through which the uh, nuclear powers would take their, uh, uh, their military programs. Nonetheless, it uh, showed the promise of potential agreements between the two rival blocs in this field. Uh, over the course of the next five years, the Johnson administration laboriously negotiated the Nonproliferation Treaty, uh, which was an agreement codifying more or less the status quo. Those countries who had already fielded nuclear weapons by, I believe, uh, by December 1st, 1967, would retain them, these being uh, the five legitimate nuclear powers, the United States, the Soviet Union, uh, Great Britain, France, and China, whereas uh, signatories of the treaty who had not uh, tested nuclear weapons by that time would agree to remain non-nuclear. Uh, 
Johnson also set in, uh, set in motion a process of strategic arms limitation negotiations uh, with the Soviet Union, uh, who, uh, which would not come to fruition until the presidency of Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger would come to um, embody a period of time in U.S. foreign policy. Uh, the two, uh, uh, the first, a president who uh, had been, in his own word, words, uh, sent into the wilderness into the 1960s after spending eight years as Eisenhower's vice president. Uh, the other is national security advisor Henry Kissinger, uh, a Jewish immigrant and Harvard president, or sorry, a Jewish immigrant and Harvard intellectual, uh, both saw themselves as outsiders and they wanted to bring, much as Kennan had previously professed, uh, a new rigor and uh, realism to the conduct of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, under this realist rubric, they would pursue interest and not ideas. They would be opportunistic. And they would also conceive of affairs between states as an amoral domain, uh, neither, immoral or, neither immoral or moral. It was simply a field of opportunity uh, to attempt to exploit. They also concentrated power in the White House as never before. Um, the Secretary of State at the time found himself cut off, uh, cut out of, nu of numerous foreign policy decisions. But from here, they attempted to uh, implement uh, a grand design for U.S. foreign policy that was perhaps uh, more ambitious than many that had come before. And it was perhaps best encapsulated by uh, what came to be known as the Nixon Doctrine. Um, uh, first, the United States would keep its treaty commitments. Second, quote, we shall provide a shield if a nuclear power threatens the free freedom of a nation allied with us or a nation whose survival we consider vital to our security. But third, in cases involving other types of aggression, we shall furnish military and economic assistance when requested in accordance with our treaty commitments. But we shall look to the nation directly threatened to assume the primary responsibility of providing the manpower for its defense. In short, this added up to an expression of uh, reluctance to interfere in, the, uh, in uh, military conflicts the world over. Uh, in the uh, context of Vietnam, it showed uh, a recognition of the limits of American uh, military might and foreign influence uh, that had perhaps been lacking in the previous administrations. But it also showed uh, a, sort, a certain moral void that the United States, as a corollary to this doctrine, would also ignore human rights violations of authoritarian regimes as long as they remain friendly to U.S. interests. And this became apparent in numerous countries at the time, including Chile, uh, Brazil, and Iran. Nonetheless, there was a positive outcome uh, to this new design, uh, which Nixon and Kissinger styled detente. Uh, the first was the culmination of the negotiations with the Soviet Union and the entry into force of the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, the first occasion upon which the superpowers agreed to limit their nuclear arsenals. And it also came about by perhaps the greatest foreign policy shock of the 1970s, the opening to China. And this was conceived in a, uh, in a very almost Machiavellian, uh, uh, um, um, Machiavellian scheme. Uh, Nixon and Kissinger saw the opportunity to include China as, and uh, some opportunity for US-China uh, exchanges and collaboration as a way of uh, allowing the United States to pit the two communist giants against one another in what they call triangular diplomacy. The most significant uh, accomplishment of detente, however, was, uh, was uh, the normalization of the European security context. And through a series of conferences on security and cooperation in Europe, in 1975, after Watergate and uh, the resignation of Richard Nixon, the Gerald Ford administration managed to uh, 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 work out a treaty with the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies to accept and recognize the status quo in Europe, including in Germany, finally bringing the Second World War to a close. Interestingly, the Helsinki Final Act also included language on human rights and its preservation uh, uh, globally, including in the Soviet sphere of influence, which would become, uh, which would prove quite bothersome for Soviet leaders uh, as they found themselves attacked upon these grounds uh, by the Carter and Reagan administration. Finally, Nixon was able to bring, perhaps belatedly, an end to the Vietnam War. 
Uh, U.S. forces finally pulled out in 1973 after a period of Vietnamization in which uh, the United States attempted to hand over uh, uh, authority and uh, uh, um, responsibility for the security situation to South, Re South Korean forces. And this was described as peace with honor, that the United States would pursue peace, but nonetheless it would be in such a way as to preserve its credibility and its reputation. Um, there was nonetheless criticism of Nixon's waging of the Vietnam War, particularly uh, expanding the conflict into Cambodia in order to hit the Ho Chi Minh Trail there. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, U.S. direct involvement came to an end in 1973. The result, however, was a weak state, and South Vietnam could not stand up without its U.S. backers. Uh, only two years later, uh, the capital of, its capital of Saigon fell. Uh, US, it was such a shock that U.S. forces actually uh, had to scurry in order to remove their uh, diplomatic and military personnel uh, from the besieged capital. And in its wake, the failure, the perceived failure of the Vietnam War left a deep and lasting mark on the American political consciousness uh, that would come to be summarized afterwards as a desire for, quote, no more Vietnams.